Okay, so the topic is future money. Um, basically, I'm going to talk about a different kind of concepts like uh, cryptocurrencies in, in general, uh, Bitcoin versus other cryptocurrencies, talk about immutability, uh, lightning network, also a little bit lighter topic perhaps, uh, the payments of the future, like how we will act, how will we actually pay in practice in the future. It's not necessarily a crypto-centric topic, but I think crypto can mix in well with that. Then I'm going to summarize with what I think uh, the future will hold, especially for crypto and payments, and so on. <laughs> so let's start. I'm um, going to tell you a little bit about myself. First, I'm co-founder and CEO of Prezos. Uh, Prezos is uh, a crypto company founded in 2012, so we've been doing this uh, for quite a while. Um, and a big disclaimer, everything I'm telling in the presentation is purely my personal opinion. So this is a very personal presentation, not really representing what our company is doing in the space. Um, so that's good to know. But anyways, uh, Prasos is doing um, basically cryptocurrency brokering based from Finland. Uh, we have a European brokering platform called Coinmotion, or we kind of think of it as an investment platform, but we don't officially call it, call it that. Um, <coughs> we have Bittiraha, which was our first service. It's a information, news, blog, website for Finnish people, for Bitcoin, the largest one. Uh, since 2012 and now. Um, it also has simple buying and selling features. Then we have a Bitcoin ATM network in Finland with 10 machines, which works with cash. And we also have Dinarium, which is our physical wallet brand. So basically it's physical coins that have a Bitcoin wallet in them. Uh, kind of a cold storage, but it's really nice looking, kind of a gift and collectible type of thing but it's an actual wallet which can hold an, uh, any amount of Bitcoin. We have gold, even gold coins, silver coins, bronze coins, gold-plated coins, and now we're coming up with gold bars as well, which is the newest, newest product. But anyway, that about process, and so we do a lot of things. We're also looking at launching a crypto fund, a Bitcoin fund at first, perhaps some other type of funds as well. So we're definitely doing a lot of things, but our focus has been moving towards crypto investing, crypto investments really uh, tightly. So we, we did all of these things in the ecosystem since the beginning, but now we're really focusing on the investment side. But about me, I've been in Bitcoin since 2011, uh, first as a hobbyist and a miner, and then I started being kind of a, kind of getting into the idea that it's going to actually change everything. Um, it's going to challenge the central banks, truly challenge them. Um, so I got really, really interested from an ideological point of view. And then I started founding process and, and, and it's um, founded the company wasn't like, oh yeah, we're going to build a big startup that's going to make a lot of money and, and going to make a big exit. It wasn't about that. I don't still have an exit plan, even though I'm running this for six years. I, I, I truly don't have an exit plan. Uh, but we've been growing growing quite a lot, but it's kind of a passion. Uh, crypto and Bitcoin especially is something I like. Uh, I still think it's extremely revolutionary. I believe in it more than actually at any time before. So, um, so I just like to do what I'm doing, and, and that's as simple as that. Uh, in, in the past, I played online poker, actually, professionally, I think from 2006 to 2011. And I've done some work in the IT sector. I have a bachelor's degree in, in IT, specialized in networking. Yeah, that's enough about me. We can go to the actual, actual topic. So, tokenization is the future. Blockchain will take over the world. This seems to be the pitch nowadays. As we can see, there are many, many different coins. And 
Uh, we've seen this, this revolution of different tokens in the last couple of years. Like since basically Ethereum started in 20, 2015, we've started to have this trend of, of everybody having their own coin. You can literally have your own coin if you want. And of course, we have the legendary Dogecoin there, which is absolutely great. Um, <clears throat> but um, as much as, uh, as this, this is cool in a sense, I, I think there's a lot of uh, falsehood in, in, in this picture. And what I truly personally believe is more like this. And if, if I think like, what am I really interested in, in in the crypto space? I think it pretty much goes to this area. So in my opinion, there's only one cryptocurrency that's truly re relevant and it's Bitcoin because it's the only one that has the immuta immutability, the decentralization, the security that's required for uh, it to be a relevant cryptocurrency. And I'll talk about that a lot more in the next slide about how important immutability is and, and why it makes Bitcoin different uh, from basically all the other cryptocurrencies. <coughs> And of course, there's a lot of things. There's so much more liquidity in Bitcoin. There's so much more uh, network effect. It's much more known as a brand than any other, any other crypto. There's a lot of things, uh, but, but uh, it really comes down to the fact that I simply trust it more in a tech, from a technical perspective. And as I said, I will go to that in more detail. There are a couple of coins I kind of like because they add something to Bitcoin. The, to the Bitcoin ecosystem uh, clearly. One is Monero, which is focused completely on privacy. And as, as people who are familiar with, with cryptos know that Bitcoin is very not private. It's extremely transparent. Uh, you can supervise all the blockchain traffic. Basically, there are tools that you can use to, to find out what's going on and uncover identities and, and so on. Extremely unprivate. So that's basically the key issue with Bitcoin. I would say it's, it's one of the only issues it, it really has. So, so Monero is, is kind of doing the technical development on that side to really try to make a private uh, cryptocurrency. It's very difficult because it's kind of a mouse, cat and mouse game. The, the analysis tools are getting more advanced. At the same time, Monero is trying to upgrade its privacy. But I think all the ideas coming from, and there are some other projects as well that are doing privacy enhancements. I think they're useful because they give us ideas of what we could do in Bitcoin. Some of them are not doable in Bitcoin because they require too big of a protocol upgrade, which is not possible because Bitcoin is immutable. And that's um, kind of good and bad, but I think it's more good, so we have to live with it. But there are some privacy upgrades we can do without like doing hard forks and stuff like that. We could uh, enhance the privacy with various methods. I can talk about that a little bit more as well later. Litecoin, I think, is sort of useful because it's been as a test net for Bitcoin. Uh, the SegWit upgrade that Bitcoin got was basically activated first in, in uh, Litecoin. And that really helped with the activation in Bitcoin. It actually helped because the community was split. It, uh, well, somewhat split. There was some controversy around the upgrade. And it went smoothly uh, in Litecoin, and, it, and they were able to push it there. So then it made it easier uh, for Bitcoin to get that upgrade. And I hope Litecoin does stuff like that in the future as well. Now there's the Schnorr signatures is the next big upgrade for Bitcoin. I hope they do it first in Litecoin, so we see this kind of... Because if you do something in testnet, like Bitcoin testnet, it's not real in the sense because it's not real money, it's worthless tokens. So it's not the same thing as doing it in another cryptocurrency, which is actually worth something on the market. If you do an upgrade there, you validate it in kind of a more meaningful way. So I see the Litecoin testnet as much more useful than the Bitcoin's own uh, test net with, with uh, useless tokens or worthless tokens. Okay, this is a wall of text. I was actually meant to make it a little bit smaller, but I sometimes uh, kind of get carried away. So don't try to read all of it. Let's just concentrate on the top 
paragraph, so one paragraph at a time. So <clears throat> the first one is like, what makes cryptocurrency and blockchain unique compared to legacy systems, uh, such as, let's say, um, central banking, commercial banking, or Visa, or, or things like that. The only thing that really makes it unique is that it's not under centralized control. Nobody can change the rules without the uh, wide agreement from the, from the user base. No centralized party can tamper with the ledger, so you cannot like change the history. Uh, no centralized party can freeze anyone's tokens, so everyone is like can trust that my account will not be frozen. You cannot trust that with banks. You cannot trust it with Visa. You cannot trust it with PayPal. There are a lot of cases where funds get frozen, even though the person is not even doing anything illegal. It's, he's just suspected of doing something, and, and they just freeze it. Uh, things like that don't happen with Bitcoin, because you cannot freeze um, the funds. And <coughs> wait a second. <clears throat> and now we come to the other important part, which is the second paragraph. Um, and also, in the first one, there was the part about you cannot create new tokens at will. Like Bitcoin has the 21 million cap. You can just create that much, and, and um, you, there's no party that can decide, let's print some more. You ha if, if that were decided ever, which I think is unlikely, it would have to be a wide consensus of the whole user base. <clears throat> but the important thing now, like why is Bitcoin different to other cryptocurrencies? Like I think this, this uh, kind of argument, like how it's different to fiat money and stuff like that, that's pretty old, like we've been talking about these arguments since 2011. But now that there's a lot of other cryptocurrencies, I think it's also important to differentiate the different cryptocurrencies from each other. Because for many people, they're like the same. They're like... Somebody's just a fan of Ripple, somebody's a fan of EOS, somebody's a fan of Ethereum, somebody's a fan of Dash, and so on. But why? Usually it's just because they've been listening to the hype around that coin and they just became a fan of it for really no reason other than just it just happened to, to be uh, kind of, they ran, ran into it in, in, in uh, advertisements or friends or, or other uh, avenues. <laughs> but I think it's important to really see like what's the actual difference between the coins. And I think that <clears throat> Bitcoin really stands out in this sense that uh, there's uh, proof that it's decentralized. There's proof that it's immutable. Because <clears throat> you can only prove it in a situation where somebody tries to attack it or tries to change the rules or do various things. And in Bitcoin there has been various struggles yeah, there's been scaling debates, <clears throat> it's been torn apart the whole community in, in different ways. There's been groups of corporations in the, in the economy, crypto economy, trying to change a, a certain part of Bitcoin's rules. They've failed at doing that. They've failed every time. <clears throat> so Bitcoin is extremely difficult to change in any way. Sometimes it's not good because it can, um, like, you, you can, it's difficult to do any kind of development on Bitcoin or, or big improvements because it's difficult to change. But that's one of the key features of Bitcoin because when we know it's that difficult, we know it's also difficult to do any kind of bad changes. So effectively, for example, the number of Bitcoins in existence, like how many will be at ma the maximum amount, how many are created, we can really trust it will stay that way at least much more than with any other cryptocurrency. Every other cryptocurrency is either completely centralized or at least much more centralized than Bitcoin. The, that, that's simply a fact. And one of the key proofs for, of this is that it's much easier, easier to make changes in those cryptocurrencies because that's really the only way you can actually uh, know how, <coughs> how centralized they are or not. Um, <clears throat> the fact that if, if they're making good changes or bad changes is in this sense irrelevant because what we're talking about is future threats of changes. Like can a state actor, for example, uh, <clears throat> threaten a developer or group of developers or miners or companies in the space 
to do some kind of change to benefit the state or apply some kind of AML laws or freeze somebody's funds or something like that. These kind of th threats have not been really relevant yet, but I believe as crypto gets bigger, they will become relevant. And Bitcoin is the only cryptocurrency I can really trust to, to uh, not fall down from those threats. Like, I, I don't trust anything else, like, uh, because they're too centralized. Uh, the states can uh, pressure and, and make changes in most other cryptocurrencies, most likely, if they really want to do it. In Bitcoin, I believe they cannot do it, even if they wanted to. And it's the only cryptocurrency that I can, then I can believe that. They may, they may be able to do it even in Bitcoin, and then Bitcoin will fail in, in its original mission. But I think Bitcoin has the best chance of, of being completely independent from anything, uh, any power, uh, like power entities in, in the current traditional economy. And that's not the case with other, other cryptos. And I think that these things are kind of <clears throat> in the core of what cryptocurrency is and what it's supposed to be and what it originally was about. A lot of the new crypto tokens are not really made with this in mind. And then often um, the, the kind of a uh, question arises like why is they why are they made in the first place like there's a lot of things you can do with simply having a database like a, let's say you would have a github type of system where where you can uh, like make commits to code and then you cryptographically sign the the commit and you people know like who who has made the the, the commit to the code and so on so uh, you can kind of have similar systems. The difference is that the, the database is held by a single entity. So it's just GitHub. <coughs> but basically, the authentication of all the changes are done cryptographically in the similar way as in, 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 in blockchains. So, um, so I think that <coughs> we have a big problem if, if the cryptocurrency is not really decentralized and uh, not really independent and open truly. Like, if it's not then I think um, <clears throat> in many cases uh, a traditional database enhanced with cryptographical signature features could be a much more smarter way to do things than a blockchain. So <clears throat> this is, this is uh, interesting to me. <coughs> Let's go to the next one. Uh, this is about like why is Bitcoin actually useful? And this kind of uh, is connected to the whole immutability issue and the censorship resistance. There was a recent study uh, about corruption and it was, I knew it was a lot, I, I knew the number was big, but I didn't know it was this big, like the, the estimate is <coughs> 6 billion people, which is approximately 85% of all people live under significantly corrupt governments. Um, and in my opinion, the more corruption and limitations of individual monetary liberty, the more helpful Bitcoin is. <coughs> so in a situation where the, where the state wants to limit somebody's ability to transfer money uh, or use money or hold money, Bitcoin is useful because it's extremely difficult to do that with Bitcoin. Um, the correct, uh, so the correct question is not what, uh, what uses Bitcoin for a Finnish person, Rather, it is uh, what uh, uses Bitcoin for a Venezuelan person, because a Finnish person mostly has the, their like monetary things in order. So you have like bank accounts, you have credit cards, you have various methods. Payments work smoothly. Like everything is fairly okay in this sense. So it's it's not really a problem. Like it's not normal or regular that banks are freezing. Uh, personal uh, customers' money in the, in the bank account. So it's not something that happens every day. So it, it's rather an exception. But in a country where it's more of a rule than exception, Bitcoin becomes suddenly uh, much, much more useful. But there is another thing where Bitcoin is useful, not just in these corrupt countries, but basically in any country. And that's about the risks of national currency. We've already seen this happen in smaller countries. We've seen uh, Venezuela, of course. We've seen Iran. We've seen huge inflation in Argentina as well, in South Africa. Uh, 
of, and also in Russia, there's been problems with the currency. Uh, we still haven't seen like a huge meltdown of a big currency like US dollar or euro or, or, or yuan. But it's a risk that exists and, and if we have a new type of financial crisis, which is more of a monetary crisis, if we have this, one, this kind of crisis, we could see one of the big ones have, a, have an infla inflationary meltdown. Might not necessarily happen, but it's a risk. And, and in these kind of situations, I would see Bitcoin as, as a pretty good uh, hedge for, for any investor, any saver. Uh, then about scaling. Um, there's been a lot of talk about scaling, a lot of articles like, okay, Bitcoin has problem scaling. And, and that's um, been true that it's been an extremely difficult problem. Bitcoin has trouble s scaling. But it's not a problem that's unsolvable. It's simply not possible to do easily because basically, as I mentioned before, in Bitcoin, the most important thing is basically the immutability. And you need decentralization for that. You need the fact that every single user of Bitcoin needs to be able to validate everything in the blockchain, him or herself. So you need to be able to run a node so you can yourself validate everything not trust a third party to do that, because otherwise you lose the point. You would have to trust the third party and then uh, you, you get back to the, the legacy systems then. So Bitcoin has been developed this way. It doesn't require more than a regular computer to run a node. Still doesn't and it, it never will likely because that's the development direction of where Bitcoin is going. The, the developers and the community at large do not want that kind of system where it requires a supercomputer to run a node. Because then, then you start breaking the immutability and the decentralization and the openness of the system. So how do you then scale if you have those limitations? There are ways to scale, like just increase the block size. So instead it's been, it was one megabyte, but now it's technically two megabytes thanks to SegWit, which is a good upgrade, but two megabytes is not going to be enough for the world. So you could raise it to 200. But then suddenly the running a node which will validate everything will become extremely hard. So that's why we don't, uh, Bitcoin doesn't scale that way. Also there's network issues, there's latency issues. You have to sync all the traffic between US and China and Europe. Uh, how do you do that with uh, 200 megabyte blocks? Not very well. You'll get a lot of latency, a lot of delay. The technology is not even near good enough like in terms of networks and computers to be able to have an efficient network with that kind of block sizes that everyone can validate with regular computers. But there has been now developed actually a lot of methods to scale without breaking that uh, like decentralization or increasing block size to, to unsustainable levels. One of them was um, recently launched uh, Blockstream's uh, liquid sidechain and it's actually, as a concept, fairly similar to Lightning Network, which I will talk about in a second. Uh, basically, the sidechain called Liquid is for settlement purposes of crypto exchanges. So a crypto exchange want to s wants to send uh, to another crypto exchange, which is most of the traffic in the Bitcoin network. Like, I would say like 80% of the transactions are transactions between different exchanges. So with Liquid, they can basically put bitcoins into the side chain and then through the side chains they can settle a lot of transactions uh, smaller really big ones quickly and, and with less cost and less I would say burden on the bitcoin blockchain um, so it's useful in the settlement part and it, especially between kind of institutional entities but when we talk about regular payments like commercial payments in online machine payments, uh, also like payments in a physical store. Then we come to Lightning Network, which is quite interesting. It's been in development for a couple of years, but it was launched in Bitcoin mainnet. Well, the different implementations, there's three main ones. There's uh, Lightning Labs, LND, then there's Blockstreams, uh, C Lightning, and then there's Eclair. Um, Eclair's, uh, well, no, uh, forgot about it. There's a French third implementation, less known by name, but a really good one as, as well. 
So, and they're all inter uh, compatible with each other. So even though there's three main implementations, they're all part of the same lightning network. So there's never lightning networks. There's one lightning network where everything is compatible. But I think um, they started around March this year in the mainnet, so using actual bitcoins. And what it basically allows us to, is to do a lot of transactions with very, very low fees and completely instantly. So it's like super instant. If you look at Bitcoin transactions, you have an announcement to the network, takes a couple of seconds to go all over the world. Then you have the mining process. It will take like average 10 minutes to get one confirmation. If you want more security, you have to wait like 30 minutes to get three confirmations. That's how Bitcoin itself works. And you do need to send a transaction in the Bitcoin network to open a lightning channel. But once you've opened it, you can send lightning transactions, which are done directly, can be done directly between the, the channel participants. And that will be super fast. So we're talking about settlement in basically milliseconds. So uh, I would say, so complete settlement in milliseconds compared to Bitcoins like a couple of seconds announcement and then, then uh, 10, uh, 30 minutes to, to fully confirm. So it, it's quite useful. It, it's meant for smaller payments. So you wouldn't be sending 10,000 euros worth of Bitcoin with Lightning you would use a regular Bitcoin transaction for that. But you would send 10 euros, even one euro. You could use, send one cent with Lightning. The interesting thing is Bitcoin is divisible to 100 million Satoshis, which is the smallest unit, which is called a Satoshi. Uh, in Lightning Network, you can actually send um, kind of parts of a Satoshi. So you can actually send a tenth of a Satoshi in the Lightning Network even though it's not technically possible in Bitcoin. But of course, when you close the, tr close the channel, which needs a Bitcoin transaction, uh, they would have to be rounded up to Satoshis in order for the settlement to be possible in the Bitcoin network. But in the channels, inside the channel, you can actually send even, even um, sub-Satoshis. Sub so I think... Um, so, yeah, so the way it basi basically works is the channel is always between two parties. So you have party A, party B. They put funds in the channel and open it through a basic Bitcoin transaction. Then they can make even thousands of payments in the, in the channel and then they close it when they want to close it. Either party can close it at any time if they want to. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's a network, basically meaning that they are rooted between different channels. So if, if person A wants to play, pay person C, it will make a change in the channel between A and B, and another change in the channel between B and C at the same time. Uh, so then you, you would have a transaction between uh, A and C. Basically, party B, in this case, the one in the middle, can take a small routing fee from the lightning transaction. These fees are generally very small because it's quite competitive. There's a lot of lightning nodes, a lot of channels, and, and the wallets will choose the most optimal channel. So if you charge too much for a routing fee, nobody's going to use that, your channels. But if, if you charge a little bit, only a little bit, somebody will use it, and you'll get a small amount of money for the routing. So it's technically possible to even make money using lightning. <laughs> that's, that's, that's interesting. Not a lot of it, necessarily, unless you have a huge amount of liquidity. Maybe if you have uh, 10,000 channels with thousands of Bitcoins in them, then you can probably make decent money if there's a lot of usage. Right now, it's simply it's in a testing phase. There was a question. I can take questions in the middle. I'll take more at the end. But if there's something that needs cl cl clarification immediately, then just uh, raise your hand. What do you have on? Okay. Okay. So one important thing about Lightning is... Um, which is important to understand. It's not an IOU system, so it's not uh, based on, on trust or loans or anything like that. The, the parties actually need to lock the funds in the channel, both of the parties, and they remain in control of sending the funds. So they will only move in the channel with the cryptographical signature using the pr uh, with the private keys of the, of the owner of the funds. 
So it's not like some third parties get control of it. Third parties are part of the routing of the payments, but the only thing they could do is basically, uh, I would say, tamper with the payments in a way that, that uh, stop them. So if there's somebody trying to make a payment, suddenly the p one part of the channel just goes offline, either by accident or in intentionally, then the payment will simply fail. You will have to do it again. But um, there's no way for somebody to just, just take the funds. Of course, there's some tricky things, so it's not this rosy. Like, there is some tricky things. For example, Lightning requires a node to be online. If you're offline, you are uh, subject to certain risks. But then there's recently they've made a lot of upgrades to this. Uh, there's a concept called watchtower nodes, which will basically watch for uh, like um, problem, like somebody trying to exploit an offline node. And the thing is that the punishments in these cases, if you try to upload, let's say, into the network, a preview state of the channel, which is not the current state, but preview state, because you're trying to steal money from the channel, and the other network sees this, they will actually punish by, it will actually punish the, the person trying the previous state by him losing all the money. So, so, th so this can also happen accidentally, which has happened recently. Uh, there's a problem with a little bit of bug with lightning backups. Uh, it's not easy to handle that. So if you're not technically very um, competent, it's easy to upload a backup of a lightning channel which is old. So it's not the current channel state, it's an older state. If you do that, you lose all your money in the channel. So it's, I would say the whole technology is not something you would put a lot of money in at the moment. You can put like 10 euros, 50 euros to test it and get familiar with it. But all of these issues, they are, they are working on them. Like the new backup systems, uh, the, the watchtower nodes and everything. Like the development pace of Lightning is absolutely incredible. Uh, there's never been anything like it in Bitcoin, at least. Um, there's a lot of developers working on this and three main implementations. It's, it's really developing at lightning speed. I see that uh, in, 2000, like in 2019, the, the whole thing will be at a totally different level and we'll also be seeing actual use cases for it. Um, it can be useful for a lot of things, even new business models where you can pay on demand for using any kind of services. You can pay a single cent. You can pay for something, let's say, every second or every millisecond with Lightning. And this can all be automated with AI and, and all kinds of things. Uh, this kind of thing is not really possible with traditional uh, payment methods. Like it may be possible with, let's say, a single bank, single centralized system, but having a universal system that would be supported potentially all over the world, I think Bitcoin specifically has that possibility. Because you don't really have uh, USD micropayments. You have, let's say, Nurdea micropayments or whatever micropayments. They are within that system. But with Lightning, it's possible to actually have a global system that's supported uh, worldwide. But it, it'll take years. Hello? Yes, I, I just wanted to quickly go back to the, what you said about being able to make a little bit of money having your Lightning channel up. Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't that kind of mean, if, if we look at the store of value and the digital gold aspect of Bitcoin, wouldn't that kind of mean that we have a digital gold that accrues interest for the first time in history, maybe? Yeah, it, it's pretty interesting. Like, I, Prasos as a company is looking at, we have a Lightning developer, we recruited one recently. He's working on the protocol itself, so we're kind of supporting Lightning's development. So half time he's doing the protocol development, half time doing app development for us. We're soon adding Lightning payments to our Dinarium store, but we're also looking at the future of what things we could do. And in the investment side, we could potentially do kind of an investment product which invests in Lightning channels and get small interest. So it could be useful for Bitcoin owners to, to get some interest through that. But we haven't really calculated the economics of this. Like, does it really make sense? Does it make sense compared like taking into account the risks of having money in the Lightning channels? Like, I think eventually having money in the Lightning channels will be very secure. 
But right now, because it's still fairly early, like putting a lot of money there, not necessarily very recommended. So we're, we're definitely looking into that. But yeah, let's, let's go for it. Here's some stats of the Lightning Network. So these are very current, like uh, I took them yesterday. So there's now like over 4,000 nodes in the, in the Lightning Network. There's almost 12,000 channels, payment channels. Network capacity, all of these numbers have been growing like, like crazy since, since March when they started from zero. So now the network capacity is over 400 BTC in total. The average, you can see here the average channel capacity is only 3.036, so $156. But this is pretty common. Like Lightning is made for small payments, so you don't really need to have thousands in a channel unless you're kind of intentionally trying to run a kind of a hub where a lot of routed payments will go through. Then you want larger channels. So a lot of others can use the channel for their payments. Uh, so I think the, the numbers are pretty prom promising. And, and the wallets, Lightning wallets are improving a lot, a lot as well. There's mobile wallets, there are different desktop wallets. Their, uh, their UX is kind of uh, like a lot better already than, than Bitcoin's UX was in, in the first, I would say, three or four years. So it, 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 the development there is definitely lightning speed. But there's still a lot of work to do. It's not really mainstream friendly yet. But if you're like already into crypto, you've been playing around with some crypto wallets, uh, I think it's worth trying out lightning. It, it's probably, for you, it, it will be easy. OK, then we're going to a lighter topic a little bit until I wrap up with my future speculation. Uh, I promised in the like the intro of the talk and also the description at the website to talk about payments. Uh, I really like to con like find this interesting, like how will we actually in practice pay in the future? I've been um, thinking about this for years, and it was already like three years ago I I, I came up with this concept of that we, we kind of came up because I was, I'm always being kind of pissed about uh, queues. Like it's ridiculous that you have to queue on a grocery store to pay or queue on a, in a bar to pay. Uh, in this day and age, I think that's the absolute worst waste of time a human being could do. Like why, why, why the hell we're doing that? All payments should be automatic. Uh, and happen without you doing anything. And actually, the technology we have today can actually um, manage that, so it's possible. Amazon launched this checkout-free grocery store, which is exactly the direction uh, I was thinking er even earlier, and I was like really happy that somebody's actually doing this, because uh, if I wasn't doing Bitcoin startup, I would probably be doing what Amazon was doing here. So check out free, free stuff. Because the way it works is basically they have sensors and cameras in the, in the store, which will track what items you take. And when you go to the store, you have to like log in. It can be your phone or watch or whatever. You can log in uh, or online. You can log in to your Amazon account. Then you go to the store, you take all the stuff, and then you just walk out. So it will register all the items you took, and it will just uh, deduct the amount from your Amazon account. That's it. And you don't need to queue in a payment line or use any kind of machine to pay. This is the payment type of the future. And I think it can be added quite well with AI. So basically, uh, in the future, you have apps and tools where uh, you'll have budgets for sim certain things. It can be groceries, it can be uh, bar tabs, or like w what kind of, kind of things you use, like entertainment, movies. You can have budgets for that, clothing and so on. And then uh, you basically just talk to the AI about the budgets, like, like what kind of budget is okay. And, and then the AI will do all the payments for you in the background. Then you'll get daily or weekly updates from the AI, like are you on budget or is it going over? So I, I think this is the type of way people will pay in the future. And I think it's incredible development because not only it will save us time, it will help people manage their money. Because a lot of the issues nowadays is that uh, people don't save. 
Like there was a study a few days ago from Nurda that uh, even though uh, a lot of, like over 50% of people don't uh, save at all. So they, they spend all their money, even though in that part of portion of people, there are a lot of people that are not uh, kind of poor or, or bankrupt in a sense. So people are simply not saving money. Uh, they're spending, they're taking loans, they're living on debt. I think this kind of, uh, kind of thought uh, will, uh, uh, or kind of system will help people save money easily, more easily because they can uh, manage their budgets. And Bitcoin as money is also something that promotes savings because it's deflationary. So, and, and, and cryptocurrency as programmable money is well suited for machine payments. Uh, and uh, I think it will combine well with this whole idea of checkout free payments. Because of course we have problems with this Amazon model like data. Who owns the data and how they can use all the data of your payments and stuff like that. I think we need to uh, fix that problem, combine Lightning and crypto uh, Bitcoin to it, then we'll have kind of uh, a good currency and, and, and very easy payments, like sound money, which is the, the term we use today. I uh, think I'm running out soon, I guess. Yeah, if, if you uh, have any questions, now is the time, and then we can take a short, short break for coffee, and then we'll have the panel and we'll go into more uh, the digital sound money. Hmm? Okay, about Lightning. Uh, so these are basically companies that are developing, right? And uh, how are they governed? Uh, sorry, the last one. How are they governed, these companies that are building Lightning? The three ones you mentioned. Do you mean funding? Funded you mean? or governed that they are? Governed? Yeah. They're, they're regular companies. There's nothing special about that, but the, it's... I don't really see a problem with that because the whole network is not, the network itself is not managed by the companies uh, and, and the code is open source. So basically what's happening is that uh, the network is, is maintained by the network participants just like in Bitcoin and, and basically they're just developing the protocol. The good question is where is, what is their <laughs> kind of, um, how, the, how are they making money? That's something I'm wondering all the time. Like, uh, I think eventually it, it could be something like, like some Linux companies have done. Like, like basically, they will, they will provide consulting for developing apps and, and putting up services on top of the network. I think it, the, actual, the money will come from something like that eventually. Any more questions? I could, I could go through this quickly if there's not input question because I, I think this is really important. It'll take two minutes. All right. Okay, so, because I, I think this is one of the most important things is the next financial crisis, uh, it, it'll come. Like, I don't know if it's going to come next year and whenever, but it, it'll be here. Like, there will be more financial crises. But the next one will be the test for Bitcoin. Because some people think it will be a store of value, a gold 2.0. Some people think it's just a speculative investment and people will let go of it in a crisis rather than going into it as a safe haven. I think this is a very interesting question, a lot of debate about this. I'm, of course, a believer it's gold 2.0, uh, definitely, and it will get there. But it's interesting to see what happens. Do people believe in that, that truly or not? And this is what I'm expecting to happen in the near future. The Bitcoin share of cryptocurrency market will grow. The use of Lightning Network will grow rapidly and we'll get more actual use cases uh, during next year. Bitcoin will get the Snore signatures upgrade. It will add privacy. It will add scaling to Bitcoin. A lot of fintech companies and banks will offer services around cryptocurrency. SEC will approve the first US-based Bitcoin ETF allowing more investors to take part. I don't know when it's going to happen. I'm, I'm betting sometime around spring. The Bucked exchange is starting now, so I think that will help ease the SEC's fears of mani market manipulation. Once Bucked gets, gets volume, SEC will approve the ATF, ETF, but it, it'll take some time. ICO bubble will pop if it hasn't already. But a disclaimer here, I actually like the idea of security tokens. I, I really like security tokens. Utility tokens is kind of, yeah, questionable. Uh, 
Cryptocurrencies will reach a market cap of over 1 trillion USD. Uh, could take a few years, but uh, I think it will happen. And then finally, automated AI-driven payments fueled by cryptocurrency will be the payments of the future. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Henry. <laughs> that was excellent and informative.